So remember that, that yamas are translated as restraints. And our second restraint is satya, which comes after ahimsa, which is nonviolence. Um, and satya kind of is roughly translated as truth. So I think it is very interesting to think about how truthfulness and nonviolence are, they go together because um, it's part, truthfulness is partnered with nonviolence. The marriage of these two guidelines creates a powerful dance between two seeming opposites. Because sometimes it feels like we can be hurtful if we're truthful. We can appreciate the statement when we begin to practice speaking our truth without causing harm to others. So um, truthfulness is sort of uh, gentrified by ahimsa. As partners, truthfulness keeps nonviolence from being a wimpy cop-out, while nonviolence keeps truthfulness from being a brutal weapon. When they are dancing perfectly together, they create a spectacular sight. When there is cause for disharmony or confusion between the two, however, truthfulness bows to nonviolence. First and foremost, do no harm. So satya is not safe, but it is good. Truth has the power to right wrongs and sorrows. It is fierce in its demands, but magnanimous in its offerings. Truth demands integrity to life and to our own self that is more than not telling a simple lie. When we are real rather than nice, when we choose self-expression over self-indulgence, when we choose growth over the need to belong, and when we choose fluidity over rigidity, we begin to understand the deeper dynamics of truthfulness and we begin to taste the freedom and goodness of this jewel. So now I'm reading it and I'm thinking about growth over the need to belong and what our friend um, Brene would say about belonging versus. So I suppose if we are speaking our truth, we are in a place where we belong with the right people. We choose the place where we belong. So being real rather than nice, a lie would make no sense unless the truth was felt to be dangerous. Why do we lie? Are we afraid to hurt someone's feelings? We're afraid if we told the truth, we would not be liked or admired anymore. And then she tells stories about people. And I, I, I feel like this is, again, I, a lot of our patients who are in chronic pain, I think many of them feel like what these what her person's friends feel. I pick the right size box, put myself in it, wrap it with a pretty paper and bow, and then present myself to the other person. Um, I have another friend who says, I always show up differently with different people. My biggest fear is that everyone I know will be in the same room at the same time and I won't know who to be. Can you think of other people with a lot of pain who are, I really, I can think of several people. Oh, this hurts and this hurts and this hurts, but they're so nice, they're so nice. Um, Um, the topic of nice. I once heard a, a yogi guy say, yogi, yogi Raj Achala, you have to watch out for nice people. I have a friend like this who is not really much of a friend anymore. Um, I began to see the distortion that sits between real and nice. Nice is an illusion, a cloak holding lies. It is an imposed image of what one thinks they should be. People who are nice hold truth inside until they reach a breaking point. Real comes from the center of our unique essence. Real asks us to live from a place where there is nothing to defend and nothing to manage. Real is something we might not always like in another, but we come to know there will be no surprises. Real, though not always pleasant, is trustworthy. What is driving you to distort yourself or silence yourself or say yes when you mean no? I got to thinking about when we um, when we opened, there was a I, there was a struggle. Oh, I'm a business owner, and so now we need to. I need a better car, and I need to dress nicer, and I need to. And we need to go to all of these networking events. And we quickly found. I think there was a lot of going to some of those networking events where we found being nice rather than real, and so they didn't like feel like a place that w- that was good. So we try really hard, and I. As I was reading these this morning, I thought how very, very um, interesting it is that um, our values, our values of um, love, 
kind of match up with ahimsa of nonviolence and integrity sort of match up with this satya or truthfulness. So I felt very proud when I read that. I was like, oh, look at how these, we've chosen some really nice values. They kind of match. So this week, our job is to look at real and nice um, and how that affects our own selves. But I really think we should look at some of our patients and it's not, uh, it's not, it's not inappropriate when it comes in the if the situation is correct with our patients to bring something like this up without saying, "You're so you're so nice, but you're not real." You know, I, I often will get out a book like this book and read it if it seems like it's an appropriate thing to bring up, so that it's not like I'm saying, but it's something that I've found in a book. Page yes, right. Would you like to borrow this? So this week, observe the difference between nice and real. Notice situations where you were nice. What did this experience invoke in you? What were the results? Notice situations where you were real. What did this experience invoke in you? What were the results? From whom or what do you seek approval? Does this affect whether you act from your niceness? Or your realness. I think we can be real and nice. <laughs> so that's that's Himza. That's where Himza tempers the that. So let's